one. Uh, I hope to never be in one. I hope that you're never in one. Anybody go to Mark Jenkins' presentation last night? Anybody see that? Nobody? Okay. Then I guess I won't go there. All right. Uh, we're going to start off with a little team building. The first thing I'm going to have you do is shut off your cell phones. I want you to be paying attention to what's going on here because it's pretty important, okay, and it all kind of interfaces. All right, and then I want you to go around the room. We're going to do a little team building. I'd like you to stand up and get eye contact with everybody else in the room. You need to tell me your name or where you're from. Why are you here? Why are you taking a snow base course? What's the purpose of that? I'd like you to tell us all something no one or very few people know about you. All right? And then I want to know what your favorite breakfast drink. Let's start with you. You're the troublemaker. All right? Go. All right. So I'm McCoy Phelan. I'm from Sunburst, Montana. I'm here because I'm an outdoor major. And I just thought it'd be fun to take snow-based activities. Um, something no one or very few people know about me is that I've swam with stingrays before. And my favorite favorite breakfast drink is coffee. Excellent. Good job. You're next. Um, I'm Kayla Sayer. I'm from... Say that again. Kayla Sayer. Kayla. 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 Yeah. I'm from Paul, Idaho. Um, I'm here because it's just part of my major. Uh, something, um, um, I really love donuts, and then my favorite breakfast drink is coffee. Okay, how about you? I'm Sage Michael. I'm from Laramie. I'm here because it's part of my major. Um, something to you no one knows about is I swam with sea lions. And my favorite breakfast drink is coffee. Okay, a lot of coffee drinkers. I know you, you, know, you were here. Anyway, go ahead. All right. My name's Tim Herzog. I'm from Broadus, Montana. Um, I'm here because it's part of my major and because I wanted to know how to better. I'm not very good. And something one or, no one or very few people know about me is that I got to meet Conrad Aker, which is pretty sweet. He's a professional climber and one of the others. And my favorite breakfast drink. Is probably talking about. Awesome. Young man. <clears throat> My name is Marcelo Souza. I'm from Brazil. I'm here because I like to do outdoor activities. Um, something some people know. Uh, maybe that I'm addicted to ski. <laughs> and favorite breakfast drink. Uh, I don't have, I don't take breakfast, so just water. <laughs> okay. And lady? I'm Robin Cunningham. Uh, I'm from Michigan. This is an extra class of baking. And I ranch and I believe orange juice. Okay. How about you? I'm James Holston. James? Yeah. Uh, quick question for the second one. Would you say born or raised? Or just both? Would you like to know? Uh, where were you born? Yeah. Born here in Powell, raised in Milford, New Hampshire. Yeah. When I'm here, I'd like outdoor activities. It's one I thought would be fun. As for something that somebody nobody knows about me or knows little, I think that's probably like I've done competitive swimming for roughly 10 ish years. As for a drink, Smell for water. Okay, very good. How about you? I'm Dylan Simmons. I'm from Heisham, Montana. I'm here because I like outdoor activities. Um, not a lot of people know this is not my natural mustache color. <laughs> um, favorite breakfast drink is probably so easy. Did I get that right? It's Ian. Yeah. Ian. Thank you. Sorry about that. <coughs> All right. <coughs> My name is Marshall Rhodes. I'm from Newcastle, Wyoming. Uh, um, I'm here because I needed 12 credit hours and I thought that this would be a fun and easy class. And 
I'm a 17 year old uh, and I play soccer here at Northwest and I'm also, uh, my major is aeronautics, so I'm a pilot and my favorite breakfast is the water. Okay. Uh, my name is Caleb Welby. Uh, I was born in Montana, raised in Wyoming. I'm here because I know almost nothing about avalanche safety and traveling uh, through the mountains, uh, especially during the winter. Uh, something not many people know about me, I swallowed a bee once, accidentally. <laughs> and my favorite breakfast drink is probably coffee. Excellent. Great. Well, you know a little bit about me. I'm Kenny Gash. I'm from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Why am I here? Because the college hired me to teach this course. Obviously, and I have a passion for teaching avalanche courses. Something no one or very few people know about me, I have never bought a TV set. I've owned several, but I've never purchased one myself. And my favorite breakfast drink is green tea, okay? Now, why do we do this? Why do we just do this exercise? Anybody have any questions or suggestions why we did this? We're team building, okay? And we're communicating with each other. Everybody here now knows something that they didn't know five minutes ago or ten minutes ago. And when we go out into the back country, especially in avalanche country, we really want to communicate extremely well. We don't want to assume anything, okay? We want to communicate. Tim, I'm going to go up here. It's going to take me ten minutes. I'll be back in 20 minutes, because it's 10 minutes out, 10 minutes back. Do you understand me? Yeah. Yes, okay, good, that's good communication. Eye contact, you know, good verbal communication. I think Keith had a little trouble with you guys verbally communicating. That's really, really important. We are now at the top of the ridge. We're gonna rip our skins and ski down. And we're gonna make, we're gonna make decisions as a group. Okay? We're not going to say, hey, you know what, I've had enough of this, I'm going to go over here and ski alone, or I'm going to go snowshoe over here. Uh, 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 we're not going to do that. Okay? The other thing is, is that be careful who you go out in the backcountry with. Part of this exercise was to get to know each other, know who you're going out there with, trust me. And don't go out with anybody who you're uncomfortable with. And if you're going to put the time and money and effort into learning about avalanches, learning about backcountry safety, maybe taking some wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder course, something like that. Maybe put a little pressure on your peers and say, hey, you want to go with me? I've done this. Why don't you do that as well? Because when I go into the backcountry, whether it's skiing or mountaineering or climbing or whatever, I want people that I know have my back in case something happens to me, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're building, team building here. That's what that goofy little practice was about. Okay, let's talk about the avalanche triangle, okay? I forgot to get my glasses out as I can't really see without them, but this is the avalanche triangle. Okay, this is what makes up an avalanche. We've got weather, snowpack, and terrain. So let's start with weather. Okay, what what does weather consist of? Anybody, somebody, yell it out. What does weather consist of? What is weather? Heat or cold. Heat. <clears throat> so or cold. So temperature. Anybody else? Precipitation. Precipitation. Yep. Anybody else? Wind. Yep. Humidity. Humidity. These are all good. What's it like today out there? If anybody had to give a description of the weather today, what would you say? Cloudy. Partly cloudy. Partly cloudy. So, I'm going to 
put skies here. Alright? Because that, that's part of the weather. It is cloudy. But it's, it was partly cloudy just a minute ago. So you're both right. Okay, anything else? That pretty much covers it, huh? Temperature, precipitation, wind, humidity. Does anybody know at what wind speed does snow move? How many miles an hour does the wind have to blow before it actually moves snow? I don't expect you to know this, but I thought I'd ask just in case. 10 to 12 miles an hour. When you look down and there's snow blowing across the surface, you know that the wind is blowing no less than 10 miles an hour and possibly more. And there's a term that we call movement of snow by wind, and it's called saltation, all right? Why is this important? Because wind can move snow 10 times faster than it'll ever fall from the sky, depending upon how, how much the wind is blowing. Well, we'll get we'll get into wind loading and what saltation can do to a snowpack as the course goes on. But it's important to know these these little items. Ten to twelve miles an hour will move snow, and wind will move snow ten times faster than it will fall out of the sky. Okay. Um, does anybody know what a snowflake is called when it falls from the sky? You know those pretty snowflakes that you decorate your Christmas tree with or put at the top if you don't use an angel? Any clue? It's called a dendrite. Dendrite. You know how a dendrite, and sometimes they're called stellars too, but does anybody know how, how a snowflake forms? Any clue? Typically what happens is there's tiny dust particles in the air. And these dust particles are blowing around up there. And they collect water, <coughs> water vapor. There's water vapor up there. And they get moist. They take on moisture. And then they'll take on more moisture and they'll take on more moisture. And all of a sudden they become so heavy that they fall to the earth. And when they fall to the earth, they freeze, and they turn into a snowflake. And we all have heard that snow, there's no two snowflakes alike. It's absolutely true. No two snowflakes are ever alike. Once that snowflake hits the ground, this dendrite, it becomes a grain. The second it lands on the ground, it then becomes what we call a grain. The thing that's really interesting about snow science is that from the time that <clears throat> dust particle collects enough water to fall to the earth till the time the snowpack melts and returns to a state of water, a liquid state, it's constantly changing the entire time. That's why snow science is so complex and so dynamic. Because every snowflake is individual and every snowflake is changing constantly. It's constantly changing as it falls to the earth. Once it hits the earth, it's constantly changing. Now granted, it's going to change at different rates and we're going to get into that. Okay. It's going to change at different rates. Some rates are better than others. Um, but it's constantly changing. Okay? There are very few hard and fast rules in avalanche. But one of them is, is that snow does not like rapid change. Have any of you ever seen, I'm sure you've all seen it, where there's snow on a roof and it kind of creeps off and hangs over and you see this thing hanging down off of a roof or off of the hood of a car. Yeah, that is a demonstration of what? How strong the snow can be. 
under under slow change it can become very 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 strong very strong okay does anybody know what we call that when we see snow that's really strong it's called viscose deformation and if you treat snow with time and pressure over a period of a long time it becomes very very strong Conversely, it does not like rapid change. Rapid change and snow don't get along at all. Okay, that's one hard and fast rule. The other hard and fast rule is that any time the sun is shining on snowpack, nothing good comes out of it. We all like to see a beautiful sunny day, right? And a blanket of snow. Great, it's good to have fun, go out recreate in, but it's really hard on the snowpack. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, if I was to create the perfect world for snow, I would create a world with what we would call isothermic, all right? And that, that means that the temperature is going to be the same, all right? If I was to create a perfect snowpack, I would have temperature of probably 26 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? It would be cloudy. The temperatures would not vary. There would be no wind. There would be no rain. There would be no weather. There would just be cloudy skies, constant temperature, and then kind of a, a I don't know if this is the right term, but almost like a sensory deprivation environment. And what's going to happen to that snowpack is it's going to bond. And if it snows, okay, the snow that's coming down is going to bond to the snowpack. <laughs> and it's just going to be strong. And at the end of the season, whether you've got two feet of snow or 20 feet of snow, the snowpack is going to really be boring because of why. It underwent really slow change. And we know that snow likes that, snow packs like that, right? Right? Yeah, nice. You heard me use the word bonding. Another word for that that we use in the avalanche education is sintering, all right? If somebody says, well, the snow is sintering, that means it's bonding. It's a fancy word for bonding. All right, but you'll see it if you if you go on to you know a university or take up snow science courses or take an ARI course or a AAA course, American Avalanche Association course. You're gonna you're gonna hear about that. Okay. Um, again, I said fast change affects the structure, the hardness. The grain size. <coughs> Has anybody here heard of surface horror? <coughs> Nobody here heard of surface horror? Okay. But that what that basically is is frost on the surface of the snow. How many of you have gone outside on a winter day and it's maybe gotten foggy overnight? And the next thing you know, you wake up in the morning and the trees are just covered with hoarfrost. Everybody's seen that, haven't you? Yeah. Well, the same thing happens on the surface of the snow when moisture hits it, okay? And you get this surface, surface floor. Depending upon the weather conditions, it can be more or less, but that's what we call surface floor. Has anybody heard of depth floor? No one. Depth hoar is the same basic principle, only it's found where? What's your clue? Depth, deep in the snowpack. Yeah. And where would you think we typically find that that occurring? The depth hoar. Close to the ground. Yes, there you go. Close to the ground. Here we have a surface hoar here 
on the surface of the snowpack. We have depth hoar here. Actually, this is, this is earth. We have depth hoar here. Why do you think we get depth hoar there? Actually, the earth, even when it's frozen, unless it's permafrost, emits heat. Okay? You can go outside in the dead of winter in Powell, Wyoming, and measure the temperature of the earth underneath the snowpack or just out in a field or whatever. And I would bet that you would be hard pressed to find it any colder than 29 degrees Fahrenheit. Even on a day when it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Why? Because the earth is cooling and it's emitting heat all the time. Okay? Now, permanent permafrost up in Alaska or tundra, that sort of place, that's that's a different story. We're not gonna we're not gonna go there. But what happens is the earth is is radiating heat. Okay? And let's say we've got, I wonder if I brought my conversion chart with me. Yeah, I did. Let's say the ground is 29 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Does anybody know how that converts to Celsius? Any guesses? Just a wild guess. Negative two. Negative two. Three, negative three. Someone from a logical country that does things in metric <laughs> and Celsius as opposed to Fahrenheit and feet and inches, obviously. You get an A in the course, you can leave right now and write your name. Okay? I don't know why we have to stick with the system we do, but we do. Uh, negative two is actually 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty good. Pretty good, Marcel. I, I like it. So let's say 29 degrees Fahrenheit or minus, minus two degrees Celsius, okay? Let's say we've got 10 centimeters of snow. Anybody know what 10 centimeters is in inches? How did you know that? I like you. you could, you're past two, okay? <laughs> okay, so we've got 10 centimeters or four inches of snow here to here, okay? Let's say that our temperature here on the surface, it's a bitter cold night, and let's say our temperature is, oh gosh, um, let's say it's down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 10 Celsius. That's quite a difference, isn't it? That's a difference of, um, what do we got? 15 degrees Fahrenheit, eight degrees Celsius. We really become concerned with snowpack when we have a temperature gradient greater than one degree Celsius or 10 centimeters of snow. All right? We've got 10 centimeters of snow and we've got eight degrees Celsius difference in temperature. So we have what we would call an extreme temperature gradient going on there, all right? This temperature gradient is kind of the 
the watermark, if you would, if the difference in temperature is no greater than one degree Celsius and 10 centimeters of snow, we get our old friend sintering. Our bonding is going on. All right? If the temperature gradient is, is greater than this, this is not happening. If anything, it's going the opposite direction. That snow is deteriorating. Why? Because the Earth is emitting heat, emitting heat. We've got cold temperatures here, and as the warm, moist air comes up through that snowpack, it hits colder temperatures, and it does really bad things, and it crystallizes. And it goes through a process called faceting. All right, and if you hear, if you hear, the, can I go ahead and erase this? Does this make sense, everybody? Okay, I see a lot of people shaking their heads. And I'm, I'm gonna spend a little more time on this because this is really important, really important to know, okay? Just remember that one degree Celsius for 10 centimeters of snow is kind of the standard that you want to um, you want to um, keep in mind. That's a very critical number, okay? And you've got more moist air coming up from the earth, and typically it's no it's no colder than minus two degrees Celsius, and then you get a snowpack. And, and that warm, moist air is coming up, and it's going through the faceting process, and creating facets, and sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the snow is heavily faceted. Well, that's what's happened, is that you've got depth hoar, or hoar frost building within that snowpack, typically at the ground level, okay? My daughter was pursuing her PhD down at Laramie, and uh, she was telling me, she, I asked her one time, I said, you've been out to snowy range skiing? And she said, yeah, you know, it's not great, but it's okay. There's coverage, it's not really great, but at least it's really, really cold. It's bitter cold, so we're not losing any snow. Well, first of all, I, I don't like to argue with my children, especially my daughter, and it's hard to argue with someone who has a PhD to begin with. But she was wrong, dead wrong. You know why? Because the temperature gradient was way extreme. If you have, again, if you have 10 centimeters of snowpack, or four inches, and you've got a temperature gradient difference greater than that one degree Celsius in that distance, bad things are going on in that snowpack. It's creating what we call dragons, okay? The dragons underneath the snow, all right? Let's say, let's say we're minus two degrees Celsius here, but we're minus three degrees Celsius here. Are we concerned? No, not really, because we're within that temperature gradient, okay? Let's say we've got 120 centimeters of snow. That's a lot of snow, isn't it? How many inches is that? Four inches equals 10 centimeters. You got 120 inches. 120 centimeters. Four 
feet of snow. All right. What what temperature, atmospheric temperature, could we have with four feet of snow? And still maintain that. Yeah, exactly. Actually, 13, if you consider, you know. So let's say you're minus, <coughs> let's say you're minus uh, 14 degrees Celsius. We're still good. All right? We're much colder here than we were at minus 3, but we've got a lot deeper snowpack. Okay? Now, if you ever get into taking avalanche courses, and I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to touch on this just so that you know that it happens. If you ever get into, like, say, a level 2 avalanche course, what you'll do is you go out and dig a snow pit, and you will go through, and you'll take little, little thermometers, and I'll have some with us next week, Friday, a week from today, and show you what I mean but you'll stick them in, in the snowpack every 10 centimeters. And what you'll try and do is see what the temperature gradients are like within the snowpack, because they will vary, they can vary. Okay, I'm not gonna say they will, they can vary, typically. And they typically vary most towards the top of the snowpack, okay? Um, I took my level two up in Whitefish, Montana and we dug a snow pit. We dug down 11 feet, four inches, and we weren't nearly to the bottom yet. And the instructor said, oh, there's some willows down there. We've got to be getting close. <laughs> 11 feet, four inches. That's the type of snow. I think they're old, well over 350 inches so far this year. But what we did is we started at the top. We got surface temperature of the snow, and then we came down 10 centimeters and 10 centimeters and we check the temperature of the snowpack. And once in a while, you will get some temperature gradients in that, in, with, right within that snowpack. And if you do, that's something that can be of concern too, okay? Why do you think you'd get temperature gradients within a snowpack? Any ideas? Um, kind of jumping ahead of myself here. What, um, <clears throat> what happens this is the ground level, here's earth, and this is the snow, the top of the snow here. Whether we've got 2 inches or 8 inches or 120 centimeters, if we get 6 more inches of snow, what happens to the surface? It's now buried, right? Okay, let's say we've got two feet of snow outside today, hypothetically. We've got two feet of snow on the ground out there. You go home tonight, we wake up tomorrow morning, and there's another foot of snow on top. What happens to the surface of that snow that was there today? It's buried in the snowpack, okay? I mentioned something earlier about when we were talking weather, what was one of the hard, fast rules that I mentioned about snowpack? There were two of them. It's two hard and fast rules. One is anybody, somebody. Snow doesn't make extreme changes in temperature. Rap You're close. Snow doesn't like rapid change. Rapid change. What was the other one? Bonding. Bonding? Is that you? No. It had to do with weather. 
had to do with weather. I said, no good ever comes out of what? Sun. Sun shining on the snow. Why? Because stuff goes on on the snow surface when it's subjected to days and days and days of whatever, anything. All right? There's no, there's no part of the snowpack that gets abused more than the surface, all right? Keep that in mind, that's really important. But what happens is, if you have a temperature gradient going on within the snowpack, what, what it may be is that you've now got what used to be the surface of the snow buried under a foot of new snow. And what if there's been a lot of exposure to sun and wind and everything else, there's a good chance that there might be a little ice layer, right? You know, warms up, thaws, freezes, thaws, freezes day after day, and you've got an ice layer, and you've got the earth down here emitting heat and moisture. Well, what happens is, is that stuff travels up through a very consistent snowpack that has an acceptable temperature gradient and then it hits this ice layer and what do you think happens it's like putting a piece of plastic over it and it can't get through and then what happens bad things bad things happen okay so oftentimes you will find when you hit a layer like that, a buried layer, there could possibly be some temperature gradients going on in there because heat and moisture from the earth is trapped within that snowpack. Not always. Okay. I told you there are rarely hard and fast rules with snowpack, and I mean that. We know that rapid change is bad for snow. Snow likes slow change. And sunshine on the snow is not good. But other than that, there are no hard and fast rules, okay? But I just wanted to call your attention to the fact that we can get temperature gradients a varying degree right within the snow path, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody understands that? Good. I've got Keith, you want to get the written test out and we'll see how well it goes. No, seriously, guys, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you and I don't want you to feel like you're drinking it from a fire hose, although you probably do. But if you have any questions at all or want me to explain more of this, I will. And I think as the course goes on, you'll probably go, oh, yeah, he said something about that earlier. You know, but don't be afraid to ask. I would rather not get through this course and have you understand everything that we've covered than go through the course and have you walk out of here and go, I don't have a clue what he was talking about. So anyway, yes, sir. Um, so how do you know when the ground is at like a certain temperature? Right there? Because you said sometimes it varies between like. 29 degrees Fahrenheit, how do you know if it's like warm or not as warm? Like, can you tell that? Because if it is warmer, then it'll heat snow faster on the ground. Well, yeah, good point. Obviously, if we get a heavy snow in October and the ground's not froze, the ground could be... Well, let, let's say this. Let's say, let's say it's a day in October, all right? And the sun is out and it's 42 degrees Fahrenheit and all of a sudden a storm front rolls in and dumps two feet of snow okay the earth is going to be emitting more heat moist heat than it will if it's frozen if it's frozen we know it's at least 32 degrees Fahrenheit probably no less than 29 degrees Fahrenheit okay but the thing about an October storm like that is that chances are the, the ambient air temperature at the snow surface isn't going to be minus 20. 
It might be freezing, it might be cold, it may even get down into teens or whatever, but depending upon the depth of the snow, the, the temperature gradient is going to vary, okay? How, how else, in the winter time, how do I know? I don't know. I, I know that if the ground is frozen, we know it's going to be at least 32 degrees and could possibly be as cold as 29. Does that make sense? Yeah. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No one? All right. I'm going to read out of this book. It's called Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain, and I would highly recommend this book to you. I don't know if they have it at the college bookstore, but I know Legends Bookstore and Cody has it. Whether you pursue a career in snow sciences or not, this is a good one to have. It's a really great book. Uh, Bruce Tremper is a well-known retired avalanche forecaster from the University of Utah Avalanche Center. Really, really great guy and a good book. And I want you to listen closely because I'm going to reiterate something that I said and I'm also going to probably confuse the heck out of you, so pay real close attention. Okay? Facets form anywhere large temperature gradients develop, which we just talked about, and there's no place in the snowpack that experiences as much temperature abuse as the snow surface, okay? I just talked about that. There is no place in the snowpack that experiences as much temperature abuse as the snow surface. These large temperature gradients near the surface of the snow cause low density surface snow to facet, all right? We talk what faceting is very quickly. Near surface faceted snow is caused by one of three mechanisms, diurnal recrystallization, melt layer recrystallization, and radiation recrystallization. Oh God, here we go. You don't have to remember this, I'm just telling you this so that you kind of get an idea how abusive weather can be to the snowpack because ultimately all of these things are related. This affects this, affects this, this can affect that in the big picture. You've heard of mountain ranges that create their own weather that would fall under terrain. So all of this stuff is interacting, it's all tied together. You can't just pick one and run with it. They all affect each other, okay? Diurnal recrystallization. 25 cent words, right? Each day the sun heats up the snow surface and each night, especially with a clear sky, it cools down. These temperature extremes can be very dramatic. For instance, it's not unusual for the snow surface to be 20 degrees warmer during the day than at night and experience a temperature gradient of 20 degrees Celsius for 10 centimeters, which as you're beginning to learn is a steep temperature gradient. With all this monkey business going on, it's no wonder that the top few centimeters of snow surface can quickly metamorphose into weak, small to medium sized faceted crystals, which we call diurnal recrystallization. All right? Melt layer recrystallization. We talked a little bit before. I said if we have temperature gradients in the snowpack, it might be because of a buried surface layer in there that's kind of like putting a layer of plastic in there and the heat and the moisture is coming up and it's trapped in there. Okay? Melt layer recrystallization or sometimes called wet layer recrystallization. Now here is a very tricky situation. When snow falls on a wet layer of snow, it usually bonds well and there's no problem. Okay? If a storm comes in warm and wet and then turns cold, 
we normally say that that storm came in right side up. If you hear the expression, and if you're around snow forecasting and avalanche education much, you're going to hear it sooner or later, somebody's going to say, well, that storm came in upside down. What that means is it came in cold and then warmed up, and that's always a bad sign. Well, maybe not always, because there are no hard and fast rules in avalanche education or snow science, but typically we like storms to come in right side up, where they come in, they're wet, they bond, and then the temperature is cooled down. However, when snow falls on a wet layer of snow, it usually bonds well and there's no problem. However, if the temperature gets cold after the storm and stays cold for more than a couple days, that's right, we suddenly have strong temperature and moisture gradients within the new snow, and you know what that means. Moisture from warm, wet, rain crust diffused upward through the new low density snow and it quickly grows faceted snow especially near the warm crust even though the snow bonded well initially after two to four days and under strong temperature gradient you suddenly suddenly start triggering avalanches and all something to consider normally when the storm comes in right side up we can breathe a sigh of relief. But if it stays bitter, bitter cold, real cold for a long period of time, we get temperature gradients, all that monkey business going on in the snow, like Dr. Trevor says. Radiation recrystallization sounds scary. This is our third and final one, and it's actually fairly rare, but it forms during a very fascinating process, at least for snow geeks. Common to high elevations and low latitudes, such as Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. I've also seen it while mountaineering in the Peruvian Andes. Weather with a clear sky, the surface with weather with a clear sky, the surface of the snow radiates heat into space very efficiently, and the snow surface becomes extremely cold even on a warm day, especially at high elevations say 10,000 feet. There's so little atmosphere that the snow surface can remain cold and dry even with direct sun shining on it. I would say 50% of the time when I'm out doing snow pits and avalanche forecasting in this area in the Absorcus or in the Bertus or in the Gallatin Range I would have to say 50% of the time I run into that where the surface of the snow is colder than the ambient air temperature, okay? So it's not just southern latitudes, it happens here too. Not always, but it does, okay? So why did I read this to you? To confuse you? No. I guess the main thing, the take home point about this is that there is a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on on the surface of the snowpack, right? What part of the snowpack gets abused the most? The surface. And what happens to that surface when we get snow? We get a, a fresh storm. It gets buried. And all that, all that stuff, that all that turmoil, all that chaos that's been going on is now in the snowpack, okay? Most avalanches are caused by buried surface form or surface layers. If you hear or see an avalanche report and they say, the problem today is that antagonistic persistent deep layer. They're talking about a layer in the snow, persistent deep layer, persistent deep layer. And how did it get there? At one time it was on the surface, okay? All right, any questions? Everybody has this 
totally dialed in, right? You know about, what are you laughing about again? You're a troublemaker, I can tell you. <laughs> Diurnal recrystallization, right? No, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm telling you this stuff so that you understand, again, all of the, the turmoil and chaos that goes on on that, on that surface. And then it gets buried, and then we get what we call dragons in the snowpack. Bad stuff. Okay, uh, moving along, we have weather, we have snowpack. We talked about weather, we talked about snowpack. What's next? Terrain, right? Okay, this affects this, this affects this, this affect, can affect this. Can we control the weather? Can we control the snowpack? No. Not really. Can we control the terrain? We can control where you go in the terrain. We can manage terrain. Exactly. Exactly. The terrain is what? These things, weather and snowpack, are very dynamic. Terrain, pretty static. I mean, unless there's erosion or an avalanche or something or, you know, earthquake, terrain is pretty constant. And although we can't control terrain, we can manage. We can manage where we travel. So what we want to do in avalanche safety is really, really focus on terrain management. Okay? Um, if we're going to go out there, we're going to... travel in avalanche terrain, what's probably one of the biggest things we want to going to want to take into consideration? Can they see that? Slope angle. All right. Why? Because if we're traveling on flat ground or even up to 20 degrees of an incline, we're pretty safe terrain, aren't we? I mean, if we get three feet of snow out here on the parking lot, what's the chances of an avalanche? There are not really. Okay. 21 degrees. To 30 degrees. What's that do? That increases our chances of an avalanche, right? All right. 31 degrees to 45 degrees. 45 degrees, that's pretty steep. We want to be traveling in, in terrain at that, that slope and angle after a fresh snowfall? Probably not. An optimum slope angle for avalanches is 38 degrees. So 31 to 45 is on the high end and the low end of that. 38 degrees is like the kiss of death, okay? And then as we go, as we go higher up, our avalanche danger decreases. Anybody know why? Any, any ideas? Just some thoughts. Jump in your head. Just because the snow just falls down the slope as it falls, kind of? Yeah, slope. yeah. A really steep slope isn't going to hold snow very well. And the steeper the slope, the less it's going to hold snow. So as we get past 45 degrees, we get up here, our, our danger is probably going to be closer to something like this. You know, obviously, obviously this right here. That's the danger zone. 
these two not so much and then 56 degrees on up is probably going to be pretty safe it's not to say it won't slide at some point i'm thinking of coolars in the mountains that have a snowpack in them the only way that something like that is going to slide is in the spring of the year and you get rain on it and it gets lubricated or you, you know it starts warming up and you're going to get wet slides that sort of thing okay but this is the danger zone right here so we want to manage the terrain and we want to stick to slope angles that work to our advantage all right um any questions on that You've got that all locked in your brain okay What's, what temperature gradient do we, are we achieving, we're trying to achieve? What's a comfortable temperature gradient? I just had it up here. Anybody remember? What are we shooting for on a temperature gradient? 10 centimeters for one degree Celsius. Bingo. Yeah. One degree Celsius for 10 centimeters of snow. <laughs> All right. Everybody got this? I'm going to erase it. <clears throat> Okay. What else can we do to manage terrain? We want to stay off steep angles. We want to stay out of or avoid terrain traps. Okay. Let me see what's a terrain trap. There's a valley in the mountains. A lot of snow. Big snowpack. And this valley is very narrow. Would we want to walk up through here? I wouldn't. Because you could remotely trigger an avalanche and all this stuff could come down on both sides and then you got snow and you're buried under 12 feet of snow. Okay, that's that's a, an, I, an example of a terrain trap. <laughs> I doubt any of you were around. Well, you, you grew up in Powell. You said you were born here? Born here in Powell, grew up in New Hampshire. Okay. Were you here when those two kids, or that one kid got buried out on Polecat Bench in yeah. an avalanche? Do, do any of you remember that? Were any of you here? There was a young man, high school, college age, buried in an avalanche on Polecat Bench. Do you believe that? And all it was was a train trap. It was rotten snow. You know, had been exposed to a lot of wind, a lot of sun, a lot of crap. All that chaos that's going on and the snow faceted was rotten. And he just got down into this little train trap and it literally buried him, if I remember right. Buried him alive. And his, his brother, I think, was the one who dug him out. But it's crazy. You don't need a lot of snow to get killed in an avalanche. Okay, you want to avoid terrain traps. Another thing we want to avoid um, we would probably have a, find a terrain trap right here, wouldn't we? Yeah, we could remotely, if we, if we, let's say we're looking across this slope, all right? We probably not want to cross this right here, all right? Why? Because the snowpack here, right here, is in tension. The snowpack right here is in compression. All right? If we cross this right here, again, we could remotely trigger an avalanche to come down. 
if we crossed right there, we could easily trigger an avalanche and it might sweep us down. If we're going to cross that slope, we want to cross it in a safe spot. Okay? Where it starts to roll off here again, what are we going to have? More tension. Right. There's going to be tension there. So what we want to try and guess is if we're going to cross this slope, we want to we want to cross it somewhere in here, as far away from that and as far away from that as possible. Okay. Um, you won't find this in any avalanche uh, education book or whatever, but there's an engineering theory that's called the point of, I'm going to screw this up, I'm not going to, I think it's called counterflexion. It's contraflexion, whatever. But if you have a point of bearing here and a point of bearing here and a beam, you have energy moments that are that are pushing up and energy moments that are pushing down. And at some point in this beam. Those moments equalize, and it's usually right there at that point. We want to apply that same engineering theory in snowpack, and we want to be between the points of tension here and compression here. Okay? Now, would we want to cross right there in the middle? No, we don't want to do that. We want to be as flat as possible. Okay. All right. But just think about that for a minute. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there are things on the terrain that will help anchor the snow. What would, what, what, what would a snow anchor be like? What, what do you think? What would anchor snow? Trees. Trees, yep. Trees. Rocks. Rocks. Yep. Even just brush, you know. Uh, junipers, willows, anything like that that stick up. Typically, when we're managing terrain and we're going up or skiing down, we, if we if we stay in the timber, our chances that snowpack is going to be a little bit more stable because it's anchored. Okay, it's not always, but typically, um, anchors will help stabilize the snowpack. Um, Another thing we need to take into consideration when we're managing our movement on terrain is aspect. And when I say aspect, I'm talking about direction. Okay, is it south facing? Is it north facing? Which direction do we, are we talking about? Because typically, southern exposure or a south facing aspect is going to bond or solidify quicker. Now that flies right in the face of what I told you about all the sun on the snowpack. But it's a pretty pretty good assumption that snow that's been exposed to a southern aspect is going to consolidate quicker than any other aspect. Okay? The western aspects not so much because they're subjected to what? What's what's the what's the where do our winds come from around here typically? From the west. Yeah. And what happens when we get when we get here's a mountain peak. 
and our prevailing winds are from the west, this snow that's here is going to get going to get moved a lot, typically. Oftentimes on western ridges in the Absorcas, there is no snow. Okay? That snow oftentimes goes up and gets carried up, and you'll see big cornices up above, and then you'll get wind loading here. Okay? So eastern aspects, this is east. All right? Depending upon the aspect, the snowpack can vary considerably. So based on what I just told you, what would be good aspects to travel in avalanche terrain? Pardon? Western. Western, yeah, because your snowpack's probably going to be a little bit less. And, and southern. It's probably going to have a better chance at consolidation on the southern, southern aspect. Probably the most dangerous aspect of any is northeastern. Okay, probably more than likely. Um, elevation changes, obviously. You know, typically here in the Absorcas we get heavier snowpack up high. So all these things have a bearing on the terrain. We want to manage the terrain wisely. We want to watch slope angle. We want to stay out of terrain traps. Uh, typically, too, if there's, if there's a cliff band up here, all right, and we're going to ski this mountain or climb it or whatever in the snow, we want to try and avoid getting underneath this cliff band. Because what happens is that we run into uh, a, a, a difference in, in depth of the snowpack, and oftentimes this is what we'll call a trigger point. If the snow depth is consistent throughout, it's probably going to be more stable than if there's a big variation the snowpack and um, we'll call that we're going to call that spatial variations I'm jumping ahead of myself but while we're here let's talk about it um, if you have if you have let's say here's a mountain and there's a big bowl and there's snow in there it's all white. It's all covered with snow. Looks great, right? Let's go up and ski that thing. Let's catch some lines down here. What we don't know is what lies underneath that snowpack. Okay? And this is what's known as spatial variations. I saw a really good uh, uh, presentation that this, this avalanche forecaster did at the Utah Avalanche Workshop this, this November. Um, and they took a big bowl like this and they had these mechanical things that went out and checked the snow, the depth and the density of the snow, and it was really high tech. They had, I think, 139 test sites and about 136 different readings, different results, in different places where they checked it. But, you know, maybe there's, maybe the snow here is 12 feet deep. Maybe over here, because of wind or sun or whatever, it's 10 feet deep. And then right here, there's a big rock ridge that comes down, and it's buried, but we can't see it. And the snow there is only maybe 18 inches. What's happening there? That ridge is Earth, right? I mean, it's planet Earth. So we've got temperature gradients going on there that we don't have here here. That area right there could be a trigger point. Make sense? If we're looking at that same, that same concept from a more lateral view, here's the snowpack. This is planet Earth under here, right? And you've only got 18 inches of snow here, when over here you've got 12 feet. 
we're looking at that snowpack and there's this big beautiful surface here but we don't know what lies underneath that would be a trigger point and when they do when ski patrols do or highway departments or railroads do uh, avalanche mitigation they they try and find sweet spots for trigger points like that and, and use charges detonation of some sort howitzers or sled bombs or hand charges or something to try and trigger an avalanche because that's usually what where it'll start the depth of the snow because of spatial variation curves all right questions or am i just confusing you more no you're still smiling you're about to fall asleep aren't you am i that boring really okay all right um any questions on terrain management anything like that so there's our there's our um, snow triangle what are we missing? What haven't we figured in to the equation? Can't imagine. If an avalanche happens and nobody's there to see it or witness it, does it make a sound? Like the tree falling in the forest. I just gave you a huge clue. What are we missing in this whole equation? People. Yeah. The human factor. The human factor, all right? People. Why, why is that such an important part of the equation? Because if people aren't involved, are we concerned about avalanches? I mean, I'm sure an elk or a deer or even a snowshoe hare can run across an avalanche on unstable snow and trigger an avalanche. It sucks to be them, right? But when it involves human beings, it's a whole different story, right? And then we have a human fatality and that's not cool. So it's really important to know that when humans get involved with weather, snowpack, and terrain, bad things can't happen. Um, what, what in human nature, what are the things we need to be concerned about? I mean, why, why, tell me more about the human factor. What causes humans to, I mean, why are we, why would we need to be concerned about it? Anybody? Yes, sir. We may be more excited about skiing down a great looking hillside than assessing the safety of the air. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, that's a really good point. I hike for two and a half hours to get up here and I am not turning around. I'm skiing that line. That woke you up, didn't it? <laughs> the human condition. You're not telling me what to do. I busted my butt to get up here. I am not turning around. We're going to ski that line. It's got to be great, right? What else? What am I doing? Sherry, why? I'm cold. I just want out of here. I don't care. Let's just go. I'm cold. My hands are cold. My feet are cold. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Let's just go. It's getting dark. These are all human conditions, right? You left your headlamp at home. You didn't pack enough food, you didn't pack enough water, you didn't pack enough clothing, you're uncomfortable. All of these things weigh heavily on the human condition and the next thing you know, guess what? We, have, we make 
bad a judgment. Do you know that good judgment comes from experience? And experience comes from bad judgment? Did you ever hear that? Yeah. The human condition. We can't, we can't lose our heads in situations like that. This doesn't, doesn't work. Um, let's say that we want to go out and uh, let's say Caleb and I are skiing tomorrow and we look at this line and I go, hey Caleb, you know what? We're going to come back and we're going to nail that thing next weekend. All right, let's do it. Looks great. You know, and we've got this in our mindset that we want to go back and we're going to do this line. Well, a lot can happen in a week, right? Weather is going to affect the snowpack. We think it's pretty good terrain, but a lot can happen in a week. Don't fall into that mindset where we're going to go back and we're going to get that thing. Rather, what we should do is say, hey, Caleb, I'd like to ski that line. What do you think? And Caleb says, yeah, I think that'd be pretty good. Let's kind of set that up as an objective for next week, Saturday. But let's check in Friday and see how the weather is, what kind of conditions might be happening, and what kind of problems we might exist in the snowpack when we do it. Because that's part of the human condition, too. Man, I've been planning this forever. I want to go ski that thing. I want to run my snowmobile up. <coughs> you know, don't get sucked into that trap. That's not good. The other thing we have to really be careful of is what we call the expert halo, all right? And you may have never heard of this term, but I'll bet you you've been in a situation where you have. Um, somebody that you really, really admire? Maybe a professor, maybe Keith, maybe an older brother, maybe a parent, an uncle, maybe it's just a good friend. Maybe there's, maybe it's a classmate who's brilliant, just brilliant, all right? And you're out in the backcountry with them. And you've made a decision not to ski certain terrain. We're going to avoid, we're going to close this terrain today, and we're not going to ski it. Okay? We've made this decision, and we'll get into this next Monday, as far as plan making and stuff. But let's say we're out there, and we come across this slope, and as a group, we've decided we're not going to ski that slope, but this person that we admire, say a classmate of yours who's brilliant, brilliant chemist, engineer, whatever, and they go, oh, come on. Looks good to me. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Or maybe you're there with an Olympic skier or somebody who's raced, ski raced, at the high school or college level, or at the Olympic level, we tend to do, to place on them what we call the expert halo. All right? Why? They're bright. Maybe we're out there with a supermodel, I don't know. They're good looking. They're a hell of a skier. They're a brilliant engineer. They gotta be right, right? No. We made a decision as a group not to go into that terrain. But that people fall victim to that all the time. Johnny says it's right. It's, you know, the guy was in the finals to be, be an Olympic downhill skier, you know, right? He may be the best skier in the world. He may be the best, or she may be the best engineer in the world. That person may be the best veterinarian or school teacher or professor, whatever. 
Do they know any more about avalanches than you do? Not unless they've taken up more education than you do. And besides that, as a group, we've made that decision not to see that terrain. We've closed that terrain. So what we're going to do as a group is, is say, hey, Johnny, go sit on it. We're not skiing that, and neither are you. We made that decision. We're not going to ski that. We're moving on. We're going to go ski that slope that we deemed in our morning meeting safe to ski. All right? We're not going to place that expert halo. How many of you have been in a situation like that? Well, all of a sudden, somebody just says, ah, oh, come on, let's do this. You know, this has got to be safe. Surely some of you have been in that situation before, right? Yeah. The expert halo. We put that expert halo on them. All right? You're out in the backcountry with the weather forecaster. Hey, he's great at weather forecasting. We're talking avalanches here, you know? Maybe the guy's a brain surgeon or the gal's a brain surgeon. Great. Do they know more, any more about avalanches than you do? No. Don't be putting that expert halo on it. Um, one of the things I neglected to, to do, and I had this setting right here. I guess I can't see without my glasses. This is what we call an inclinometer. This is about a little, I don't know, $10 tool. I'll pass this around so you can see it. But that's how you check slope angle. And what you do is when you're out in the backcountry, you take your ski pole or your whatever and just lay it on the, on the snow and you set this thing on it and you go, oh, okay, that's 15 degrees. Carry this in, in your pack. All right. You can also get apps on your smartphone. I've got one on mine. I don't use it because I don't take my phone with me because I don't want to lose it or damage it or whatever. But um, you can get an app. On your, on your smartphone, you just turn it on and you can take your phone and tip it. And it'll tell you what de degree the slope angle is. It's pretty cool. Okay, any questions about anything? We've got 25 minutes yet, so I'm going to keep rolling here. And again, I'd rather have you understand exactly pretty much everything I've talked about rather than not get through the, the entire contents of the course, then have you walk out of here and go, oh man, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, anatomy of an avalanche. Here's the skyline, here's the ridge of the mountains, these are timbers, uh, timbered pockets. We've had an avalanche here. This is called the crown, where it breaks away. This is a flank. And this is a flank, all right? I gotta get this get this right. I'm not a good speller. Okay, you've got the crown, that's where the snow breaks away and forms an avalanche. This is the bed surface. This is where the avalanche has occurred and has taken everything down to a bed surface. Now the bed surface could be the ground or it could be a persistent weak layer in the snow. Normally, it's a persistent weak layer. Oftentimes you'll see pictures of avalanches and they're inspecting the crown and there's a layer of snow and it oftentimes looks just like this floor. It's, really, it's a hard surface. Okay? That surface probably was buried, a buried surface layer that was weak. But it, that's the persistent deep slab we were talking about, a persistent weak layer. Okay? The flank is the sides of the avalanche where it broke across. 
The staunch wall is where the snow stopped sliding. And I've seen pictures, I've seen videos rather, of people caught in avalanches. I saw one, the guy was on a snowmobile. That was really cool. He, he actually powered out of it. But when the snow starts sliding, and they had this, they had this GoPro on, and if you look down the slope, the snow was sliding, and all of a sudden this wave appeared. And it looked just like a big surf wave. That was the snow going over the staunch wall. This area in here has slid. This area down here has not. So what happens when that snow hits that staunch wall, it goes up and goes over the top, all right? What we want to do is when we're in an avalanche is try and get to the side of the flanks before the staunch wall. And the reason is because once you go over that staunch wall, you're going to get rotor tail big time. It is talk about chaos. It's just getting tumbled and and then it's, it's running and it's picking up speed and it's really ripping down here. And if you're caught in this, you're just going to get rotor tail. And then it's going to run out into the deposition zone, and this is where it's all going to end. And it all depends upon the train. Um, we're going to we're going to see a movie hopefully on Monday and do a case study on it. And you get a little bit better idea of what, what I'm talking about. Pretty, pretty mind-boggling. Um, but anyway, that would be what we call the anatomy of an avalanche. Make sense? Okay. This is the terminology that you'll, you'll understand now when somebody talks about that. So how do we want to, um, how do we check for how do we check for avalanches? How do you know if there's avalanche danger? Okay, there are some avalanche websites that you can go to. Uh, jhavalanche.com, Jackson Hole Avalanche Center, uh, Gallup National Forest has an avalanche center. You can go on their websites. And again, maybe Monday we'll go through that. I brought my computer and I want to sit, sit with you for a minute after we're done here. Maybe you can get the ULRs and do it on your computer because I don't know that I can get on the internet. I've tried before and I'm not that luck. So anyway, uh, but there are some, there are some sites. Um, keeping good track of the weather. A good, you know, a good a good weather forecaster and a good avalanche forecaster. If they if they keep really good records of the weather from the time it starts snowing till the time it melts, they could probably predict avalanches without even going outside because they can check snowpack, they can check temperature, and they can calculate temperature gradients pretty much without. I mean. You know, okay, so we get this much snow, and wow, we got this huge drop in temperature, or it really warmed up. They can make a lot of assumptions off of that. Um, observations, you go out, and if you see little slides, little, we call them point releases. How many of you have seen those little death cookies or roller balls on steep slopes that roll down? Most of them happen when it warms up, or if you get a little rain or something on snow, they'll roll down. Um, obviously, if you see if you see avalanches, then you know there's probably some avalanche danger, right? The conditions are right for avalanches. Um, if you're out walking in the snow and you hear what we call wolfing, and that's an actual word, wolfing. If you're walking along an alley and that snow goes whoop, that means that there's a weak layer in there that collapsed, and I've had it happen more than once. Okay, it scares the crap out of you. It's pretty, pretty scary. I've only been, I had that happen to me once on train, and I was actually teaching a, a level 
one or two outlines of course over at Jackson, and we had a group out. I think the only thing that saved our butts was that there were a lot of anchors in that snowpack, there were a lot of willows. And in our debriefing that, that night, I talked to the other instructor. I said, Are we good today? Or did we just get lucky? And she said, We got lucky today. We had five students, Eric and I, and we were spread out. And every one, we were probably 150 feet apart, and the whole slope just went boom. You could feel it, you could hear it. It's scary. It can really gets your attention. That's a good indication that those dragons in the snowpack are acting up, and you want to really be careful. Okay? Uh, we talked about telemetry, you know, the, the avalanche forecast sites. Um, there are some snowtail sites that give you record of snowfall, temperature, that sort of thing. You can, you can uh, get a lot of good information from there. Obviously, digging pits. Uh, we'll dig some pits on Friday. We'll do a column test. We'll do an extended column test. And I'd like to do a propagation saw test if we can find a slope that's worthy of doing that. Um, and I'll explain all that at the time. Uh, if we're going to do pits, keep in mind that we want to do pits representative to the slope and aspect of the slopes that we're going to ski. You can just go out and dig pits, but it, it's not going to tell us anything unless it's representative of the slope angle that we're going to ski. Okay? We want to dig a pit on the same aspect same slope angle that we're going to ski. All right? Um, because things vary a lot. They vary a lot. Uh, and then also we want to take into consideration the spatial relations like we talked about before, about how the snow depth can vary due to the terrain underneath it. Uh, if we are going to I'm going to erase this. If we are going to ski a slope or cross a slope that we think could be prone to avalanches, <coughs> we are here. These are these are skiers. Uh, I'm not a really great artist. So don't laugh at me, okay? But we know, because we saw an avalanche here at one time, right? We know that this, this slope could slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to what we call ski cut this slope. And we're going to have one of us ski across this thing at about a 45 degree angle over to a safe zone in this timber. And that person is going to stop right there. And we're going to ski one at a time. Because if this thing rips, we want people to follow it, follow the progression, want to keep an eye on us, that sort of thing. We're never just going to take off and ski down the slope. No way. All right. Once this person gets across, this one's going to get across. This one's going to get across. Now keep in mind that there are no hard and fast rules in avalanche education and snow science. <laughs> Sometimes the, sometimes the tenth person across that might trigger an avalanche, but chances are they're going to make it, okay? When are we going to do this? When we know that we're in safe terrain, and we know that safe terrain is zero degrees to 20 degrees, or, you know, 21 to 30 degrees, moderate. Um, Again, I was in Jackson one time working, teaching avalanche courses, and we had extreme avalanche danger. And we went out and skied 22 degree slopes all day long. Great killer powder. Um, and we're safe the whole time because we chose safe terrain. So if you're in an area that is suspect of sliding, you want to ski cut the slope, maybe come back again this way, 
until you get in an area where you're pretty confident that it's not going to slide, and then you can you can cut it cut it loose. I would still suggest skiing one at a time, though. Really, it's good policy. Not everybody just take off, you know. Um, I showed a I drew a picture before of a mountaintop that's wind loaded with a cornice up here and then typically you get a, a deposition zone in here of wind loaded snow if you're on a ridge and you can kick off a cornice like this that's a really good way to test it be really careful though because those cornices break farther back than you normally think and you don't want to get carried down with it and, and a video that we're going to watch hopefully monday at the very end uh, <laughs> shows exactly what you shouldn't be doing okay uh, we can do what we call moving tests and I'll show you a little bit more about that in our field day and that is, is as you're going out there you know as we're as we're on the up track or we're touring in the snow take your ski pole turn it upside down and just check the snow pack uh, if there's a fresh pack, uh, you know like a fresh layer of snow what I'll do is along the up track what I'll do is I'll just dig out a section on both sides and in the back and I'll take my hand and I'll tap it to see if it's bonded or not I'm looking at the top layer only to see if it's bonded or if there's a suspect layer underneath I may dig a little bit deeper and tap on that those are called moving tests we want to we want to spend our time out there recreating we don't want to spend our days out there doing avalanche research, you know, I mean, it's important, but we want, we're out there to ski and have fun. And uh, so anytime we do this stuff, we want to keep time in mind and get it done as quickly as possible, all right? Um, there are three basic types of snowpack. Coastal. Intermountain and continental. Where would coastal be? On the coast. On the coast, yeah. <laughs> what was your clue? <laughs> On the coast. What's a good example of a coastal? A range that experiences a coastal snowpack in the in the U.S. The Olympic Mountains. Yeah, Olympics. I'm thinking of like Mount Baker, Mount St. Helens, uh, Mount Hood. What range are they in? Cascades, coastal snowpack. Okay. Then you get a little inland, a little bit farther. Then there's the inner mountain snowpack. What would where would be a good inner mountain snowpack? Do you think? Rockies. Mm -hmm. Where's the greatest snow on Earth? Jackson. Yeah, Jackson, Colorado, Utah, Utah. That's their slogan. The greatest snow on Earth. Okay, the Wasatch Range. Yeah. Then there's a good old continental. Where do you think we find a continental snowpack? Right here in good old Powell, Wyoming. Or in the Absorcas. Why? Because most of the moisture is wrung out of the clouds by the time it gets over the continental divide. And we end up with what's left. So typically our snowpack isn't quite as much as you would find in an inner mountain snowpack or a coastal snowpack. So it's drier, number one. It's not as much, number two. And what kind of red flags would go off in your head? Yeah. If your snowpack isn't as much. What, what, scenario does that set you up for? Really? 
relationship between uh, what the snow and the temperature is less. Have what do we call that? Uh, temperature gradients. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It sets us up for a much greater chance of temperature gradients in the continental snowpack. Uh, oftentimes, the snow we have, you know, there's not much of it. It's dry to begin with. And then we get severe cold temperatures, and the snow just rots and facets. It's, it's crappy. Um, we're getting real close to quitting time here. Um, so I'm going to finish with something for you to ponder about. A skier, snowboarder, snowshoer, a dog, a snowmobiler. Actually, do you know that a snowmobile causes less stress on a snowpack than a skier does? Their weight is distributed better. They're usually going faster. I saw a demonstration two years ago at the Northern Rockies Avalanche Workshop. It's amazing. Why do so many snowmobilers get killed in avalanches now? If that's the case. But a snowmobile has less impact, causes less stress on the snowpack than a ski that does or a snowshoe. Anybody got any guesses? Do they get hit by the snowmobile? No. They're practicing poor terrain management. Where do they usually go? In avalanche paths. Hey, look at that. Let's go up and high mark this thing, right? Well, it's an abbey path. They go there because it's denuded of timber. Well, why is it denuded of timber? Because it slides every year. Duh. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of snowmobilers, you know, they see that and they go, oh, this is a perfect, perfect place to run my machine up. Well, it's not, okay? Um, and the reason snowboarders, typically, um, get caught in avalanches or perish in avalanches is because snowboards don't release. I don't want to pick on anybody here, but I'm telling you this right now, split boards in the backcountry is a cruel joke by the snowboard industry to get you to buy something that makes you believe you can safely go in the backcountry. You want skis that release you don't want to wear straps on your poles. I've got my straps cut off. It's the first thing I did, bought a new pair of poles, cut the straps off. You don't want anything attached to your body except a backpack. And actually a big backpack will float to the surface, whether it's one of those um, inflatable packs or not. Oftentimes, if snowmobilers get caught in a snowmobile uh, in an avalanche, the snowmobile will come to the surface, and the rider won't. Okay, but you want skis that release. You don't want poles attached to your body. If you have a backpack on and it consolidates your mass, that's good. Right? A uh, snowboard is like a big anchor. All right. There's been cases where people used to. Uh, their skis didn't release and took them, took them under, took them under, okay? So, split boards in the back country are not safe. Sorry guys, I'll just be honest with you. Not good. But anyway, um, a skier
skier or something on the snow, obviously at the surface is gonna cause the most distress. And as the snow gets deeper, that distress is mitigated. And at about 120 centimeters down, someone crossing the surface of the snow typically does not impact the snow from that point down. What did we say 120 centimeters was before? Four feet, yeah. Yeah. Now, if we have a persistent deep layer in a snowpack that's 10 feet, are we going to ignore it? No, because there are still some extenuating circumstances that could cause that thing to slide. But just as a rule of thumb, and when we're out digging snow 